Yeah. Just gonna have it done on the other eye now. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. If you're in the area and like to join us here at the church, we'd love to have you here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we start a new book. In our devotions, it will be the book of Galatians. So if you want to grab your Bibles, your cup of coffee, a pen, and highlighter. You're more than welcome to do that. Let's begin by prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open up your precious word, Lord. And may you encourage us, Lord God, to not just read the word, hear the word, Lord, but to apply the word also, Lord, that it may be applied with power, Father, uh, that we would have the ability and the strength, Lord, uh, to be um, obedient to the application of the word of God, that we may receive blessings from you, Father. Lord, glory and honor truly does deserve uh, deserve to you, Father God. We love you, we praise you, we glorify you, Lord, in all that you're doing, Father, in our lives. And we humbly ask that you forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings, Lord. And now minister to us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Again, good morning. Good morning, Patty. Glad you could join us and Molly there. Good morning, Diane. Who else is there? Let's see. Looks like that's it. We got two people joining us. All right. So Paul uh, wrote this epistle in response to a report that the Galatian churches were suddenly taken over by, by false teaching. Uh, there were Judaizers who were Jews and they still believed in the law and the application of the law that were coming in and trying to put these converted Gentiles who were Celtic in, in, in culture uh, under the Masonic laws. And so Paul uh, sternly and very clearly uh, writes this letter to the Galatians to defend uh, the faith of the gospel and how it is by grace and not by works. Uh, some have suggested that the, Galatia, that the book of Galatians is totally the opposite of the book of James and that you have uh, two, uh, compo was it composing? No, not composing. Uh, opposing books against each other but the reality is when you when you um read the books they actually uh flow together because it is uh, by grace and james uh that we're saved but there are works that come along that salvation and of course in galatians uh, it is by faith and not by works at all in which we are saved so the book uh, was written probably around 49 a.d um uh, maybe even 53 to 56 uh, AD. Uh, Paul writes these, uh, these young, this young church here. So let's go ahead and get into the first chapter and see what the Lord has for us. This is just a simple devotion. We read through it. I comment on whatever the Lord leaves me to comment on. So there's nothing fancy about it. Uh, you may learn some simple things, but the important thing is that we apply the scriptures to our lives, what we do learn as Christians. Uh, and we need prayer for that because we can't even do that in our own strength. It has to be done through the Holy Spirit. And so we're just praying that God will help us to apply his word to our lives. So Paul starts off again. Paul, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but Paul in the Greek means little. So some suggest that Paul was probably a small man. Mm. Um, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And so he gives us, uh, his credentials there, that it wasn't from men, it wasn't by men, but it was through God himself. And if you know the story how Paul was on his way to Damascus uh, to persecute Christians and how God blinded him and saved his soul, <clears throat> I think that every one of us has to have a personal encounter with God. It can't be because you know, someone leads you to the Lord even. I think that there has to be a point in time where that leading has caused you to either sit back and think about it or to really be moved to really receive the Lord uh, into your life. They're just a tool and an instrument. Ultimately, it's between you and God and what God has done in your life and what God is going to do in your life and you surrendering totally to Him. But it has to be a work of God. It can't be a work of man. 
there are a lot of works of men today in churches where people go to church, uh, they're never confronted about surrendering their lives to Christ. They are just equipped as Christians, as though they're already Christians. And they're walking around thinking that they're Christians, but the reality is they're not. And that's a, that's a very difficult place to be. Now, can I prove that? Yes. Jesus says, you know, you'll be knocking on the door and say, Lord, Lord, let me in. You know, and the Lord say, why should I let you in? Depart from me. I do not know you. You're a worker of iniquity. But I've done this. I've done that. No, you haven't. And so there are those that believe they've been doing the right thing, but they haven't. And that's why it's important to read the Bible. I can't stress that enough. If you're making decisions based upon your opinion and other men's opinion without Scripture, then you're going to eventually err. You're going to fall down the wrong path, and you're going to uh, create more problems for yourself. You need to read it for yourself. You need to find it in there, and then you need to apply it to your life in order for God to bless you. So Paul says, look, I'm an apostle, but not of men, but of God. And the evidence that there is a God is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all the brethren who are with me to the church of Galatea, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So you must receive uh, God by grace through faith. It's a free gift of God. There's nothing you can do, but it is through faith. And once you receive Christ, there is a peace that surpasses all understanding through the Holy Spirit that he gives you, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now there's the gospel message right there, right? I mean, he immediately gets right into it and said, the Father gave, or I'm sorry, Christ gave himself for our sins. That's the gospel message right there. Yeah. We are sinful human beings, and Christ gave himself in our place. That's the gospel. Simply said, we must realize that we're sinners. And if we realize that we're sinners, we realize that we have a need for something outside of us to bring salvation to our souls. And that person is Jesus Christ. So we must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. So we have to surrender our lives, and through prayer and seeking God, ask him to change our hearts hearts forever and ever. He goes on in verse 6, and he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from whom, from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert or distort the gospel of Christ. And so it amazed Paul that people would turn from the gospel of grace and go back to a gospel of works, uh, which is a false gospel. That is kind of amazing. I don't know why someone would think that somehow they could save themselves, especially knowing that they're sinners. I, I guess they're fighting that fact that they're sinful. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, you'll meet someone, and, and, and oftentimes when they're going through situations or situations have happened in their lives, you'll find that they never do anything wrong that they're not sinners, basically, uh, and that everyone else is, is wrong. And see, that's a, a narcissistic view of yourself. Uh, our view of ourselves should be that we're sinners, and by our nature, we're going to have the tendency uh, to love ourselves first. And that's what we do. We love ourselves first above everyone else. When the Bible says the opposite, there's a truth and a principle, right? Because Jesus says we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves already. Amen. So if anything, we're to love others more than we love ourselves. That's, that's the principle we, should, we ought to be teaching to people. Because then they wouldn't be complaining. Uh, they wouldn't be asking for more and just not receiving what they get. You know, uh, So we think to think of others more highly than we think of ourselves. And Paul was marveled that they would go back to a works gospel. Which is, an, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert this gospel. By even if we, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be a curse. So he makes a blank statement right there. Look, if I come to you and preach another gospel besides grace through faith, then let me be a curse. If someone else comes to you, let them be a curse. If an angel called Moroni comes with you with plates and saying, I have the Book of Mormon for you, let them be a curse. There is no other gospel. There's only one. 
And it's through the work of Jesus Christ, uh, by his grace through faith, that we receive salvation. So there is no others. And don't believe the lie that is out there. As we have said before, now say, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I know, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul there is giving us a hint into how he received the gospel, how he was taught. And he received it through revelation. It was Christ himself that revealed the gospel to Paul. It wasn't Peter, it wasn't any of the apostles. It was God himself. Now, can God do that? Of course he can. Of course he can. Uh, he can do anything. There's nothing that's impossible for God. Um, and he did that with the Apostle Paul. First he blinded him, and then he spoke to him, and then he took him out into the Arabian desert, and he ministered to him. And that was where he got uh, the revelation of the gospel. He goes on, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. Isn't it amazing how people can be so zealous for false things? You know, I think of, of the Jehovah Witnesses. You see them probably almost every Sunday or Saturdays, and they're out in the streets, and they're preaching their false gospel. They're going door to door. They really believe what they believe, but they believe falsely. Uh, it, they believe in a false cultic group. And yet, they are zealous for it. And you talk to them, and you just cannot convince them otherwise. And, and that's how Christians should be. But we're not. Unfortunately, we don't go door to door. <laughs> we don't even share with our neighbors or our friends anymore like we used to. Uh, we would rather just keep it to ourselves and we use the excuse, well, God will get them, God will save them, God will do the work, you know, when we should be just as zealous. And Paul's saying, look, my former life, I was zealous. I did, I outdid most of my uh, companionships that were out there. Um, man, I went beyond them. Uh, and yet, he says in verse 17, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. Oh, wait, where were we at? Tradition. 15, yeah. But when, we, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer uh, with flesh and blood. Notice how Paul said that when he was separated from his mother's womb. And yet it wasn't until Paul was on his way to Damascus that God literally fulfilled that. So that's an interesting thought right there. So God calls you even before you're born. Mm. So God knows and knew that you would be right here today. God calls you uh, to that place before you even knew it. I remember how I fought against the ministry. I just didn't want to do it. It's not something I, I, I planned on doing. It was something that God just, just put in my lap and kind of uh, forced me to do it in a sense. Um, but I enjoy it now because he's gracious and I've seen so many good things uh, come out from it. Uh, <clears throat> but it's God's call and not man's. He says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained uh, with him 15 days. But I saw... None of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, and he's the writer of the book of James. Now concerning this thing which I wrote to you, or write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterwards, I went into regions of Syria, Sicilia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches, 
the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God. <laughs> Let me just take a, a few moments here to talk about Paul's changed life and the evidence of our salvation. And I think that we should ask that question. How do I know that I am saved and heavenly bound? How do I know I have salvation in Christ Jesus? I've received Christ into my heart. I've said the sinner's prayer. I believe in what he's done, but how do I know that I have salvation? Like the Apostle Paul, he shared with us his old life, and then he shared with us his new life. Now, not only did he share with us his new life, but he shared the fact that others saw that new life and that others were drawn to God because of that new life. So the evidence of our salvation is, is not necessarily just our words, right? And words are powerful. Boy, are they powerful. I mean, there have been men who have used mere words to change nations, you know, and they could be the devil himself. I think of Hitler. Stalin, you know, some of these guys, some of these leaders of the Islamic world who use words to instigate evil and hatred towards others. I think of uh, the Democrats at this point who say they're tolerant, but their tolerance is defined it in that you need to believe what I believe and then we'll be tolerant of your beliefs. But they don't want us to believe what we believe. That's true tolerance is allowing one another to believe that. See, I don't have an issue with them believing what they believe. Okay, that's what they believe. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, hit them, attack them, or anything like that. You know, that's what they wanna believe. Let them believe that. They'll stand before God one day. But they can't stand that. They'll come up to uh, tables where Republicans or people that are against abortion, and they'll start screaming in their face. And then they'll take their signs and tear them up. Then they'll turn their t tables over. That's not tolerance. That is hatred. And yet they're calling us haters because we don't tolerate abortions. We don't tolerate uh, same gay uh, lifestyle, uh, gay marriage, lesbian, and all of that. Um, we fight against that stuff. But Paul's life changed drastically, and they saw that change, and they glorified God. They saw that he was once this, and now he's something else. So first, first clue of our salvation is that you've changed, is that you have to change from your old ways. That's the first thing that, that has to happen in your life. When you ask Christ into your heart, you surrender your life to him, you start reading your word, you start praying, you start going to church and fellowshipping, then you start changing. You start changing your mind, your heart, and then your outward actions. You have to change those things. You have to start thinking like Christ, using scripture to fill your mind with the work of Christ, the thoughts of Christ, the principles of Christ, the doctrines of Christ. And then your mind will change. And when your mind changes, then your heart changes. Because now you've got some truth in your head. For instance, um, and this is always a hot topic, but it's the topic of today. So the gay and lesbian movement, that's wrong. The Bible says it very clearly. You can't argue that fact. Even, even in the Old Testament, it was so uh, abhorred to the Lord that he, he said, stone him along with disobedient children and so forth. Now, we don't live under the law anymore. We live under grace. We don't stone, but we bring to light the fact that it's wrong. And so uh, that's the truth. You have to receive that in your mind, and then it has to get into your heart. It doesn't mean you hate gay and lesbian people. You love them, and you're going to share the gospel with them. And there have been many a pe uh, people who were in those lifestyles that have come to the Lord and have changed now their lifestyle. So even in them the change happens. So first thing is change, fill your mind with the truth, and then your heart begins to change. And so once the change happens, then the actions is the next thing. The actions start to happen. So now you have to purposely pray, God, help my actions to reflect my new faith. So now help me, Lord God, to have works. Well, what are works? Well, one is that you'll read your Bible, you will pray, uh, you will go to church. That will be a priority in your life. It will be Sundays and Wednesdays and whenever there's men's studies and women's studies. That will be a priority. That's going to be the change. Um, and then the ministry 
whatever God's calling you, your family to in serving. So all of that change has to take place. And what happens when that change takes place, people then start noticing the change. I remember my brother one time commented to me, and he says, why are you at church all the time? Mm. You know, and I didn't, I don't know if I had a sufficient answer. You know, uh, I just said, man, I love being at church. And that's all I could say. I love being at church. I love being at the men's. I love being on Wednesday nights. I love being on Sunday. I just love being around God and his people. Not that God wasn't around me. He couldn't get it, but he saw it and people will see you. And that's the third thing. People will notice that you have changed and they'll make those remarks. I remember when I worked for Edison, we worked out in the field after two years of working in the shop and then we would periodically gather together in the shop as a whole group. And you're talking hundreds of, of, of workers in this division and we'd see everybody that we saw in the shop and we haven't seen them for years. And I remember one time, a lot of them saying, Ruben, you've changed. You don't even speak the same. You've changed. And my language was a lot worse, by the way. I mean, you think I mess up words now. You should have heard me back then. But my education even grew. And they saw that. And they made that comment. And in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, I didn't realize I've changed that much that it was that noticeable. And then even my wife, there was a point where, where she, she came to me and she said, I don't even know who you are anymore because you're not the Reuben I married. You know, you're like someone totally different, you know? So people are going to notice that change in your life. You just can't help that. You'll have neighbors that will notice it. It's Christ coming out of you. It has to be noticeable. And then what happens is that they begin to glorify God because they know you can't make that change. They know that something happened in your life. And that is why there's a change. And then they'll come to the Lord. Um, when we moved to Mara Loma, which was probably like in April of 87, so it was probably about four months after I got saved, and we <clears throat> moved into our home, and people were moving in their home periodically, and I found out Calvary Chapel and was going there and excited about it, and I was inviting my neighbors. And so I invited uh, neighbors down the street, and they started going to church. Invited some other neighbors, they started going to church. And then I was witnessing to others, they started going to church. Mm -hmm. And it's like the whole block was just getting saved because they saw the Christ in us and they wanted that Christ. Um, and Mormon was next to us, couldn't get them to come to church, but I got them to move away from me. You know, the change was too much for them. <laughs> they didn't like it. And so they ended up moving and selling the house, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but that's the evidence. That's the evidence. I remember one day, a um, neighbor across the street in a two-story came over, knocked on the door, and said, I'd like to talk to you in Virginia tonight, if you, if you don't mind. It's pertaining to our children. Uh, my child, she can come over and play with your boys and stuff, but she tells me that the boys can't come to our house and play. And I says, yeah, that's kind of a rule that we have. We just won't let our boys go outside of the home. We were very protective and so forth. She goes, I'd like to talk about that. She was serious. So we went to their house and, and we uh, sat down in their couch and we started talking about why we didn't allow them to come over. And I says, you know, we're protective. We're Christians. And I made it clear, we're Christians. We believe in Christ and we believe that that we need to protect our children from outside things. And, and then they both said, well, we're Christians too. And I says, okay. And I said, okay, I know people say that, but let me tell you what a Christian is. And so I was able to share the gospel with them. And then they were so open to it and they received it. And I says, would you like to receive Christ in your heart? And the whole family, all three of them, because it was just a, a girl that they had, they all said, yes, we'd like to receive Christ. And let's get on our knees. I just threw that out there. I've never done that before. And I said, let's just get on our knees and pray. And we got on our knees and we led them to the Lord. And um, they were saved. And our boys were able to go over there. She was able to come and play with our boys for you know, years after. And then they started to, to go to um, Harvest for a while. You know, and then he was serving and he was coming over and he's talking about, because he owned a, catering truck and he he said I have tracks all over the catering truck now and he was starting to change you know that's what happens and that's evidence of your salvation that God has worked in your life I, I really do believe that all those things if not a few of those things should be happening in your life so something for you to consider we see in the Apostle Paul 
Uh, he came to the apostles, stayed with them for 15 days. He went on. People saw his change. They knew who he was, and they realized this guy has received Christ, and they began to glorify God. That's the way it should happen. And I hope that that happens for you. And all you have to do is just receive Jesus into your heart and be born again. The Bible says you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. And all you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I surrender my life to you. And then now make the choice to read your Bible, to find a good Bible teaching church. I really believe that you must find a good Bible teaching church. Amen. And then live your life there. Be committed and dedicated and loyal to those who are a part of your salvation and of your lives and bringing you to the Lord. At least communicate with them because they take the effort uh, to reach out to you, to love you, to bring you into the kingdom of God. And you at least owe that to them. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that you'll just bless us today, Lord, as we go our way. And may you be glorified and may people see us, Lord God, in the new light of your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. God bless you. I won't be here Friday. My mother is going in for an operation on Thursday, so if you would pray for her, I'd appreciate that. And then Friday, I've got to take her in for the post-op uh, appointment. So we'll be back on Monday. God bless.